what begins with red card. Okay. Uh, yeah, my name is Tao, we met several times, and I served in the Congress so here in Puerto Rico, right? And uh, I think my, my interest involved in this kind of community affairs because I want to make sure my kids grow up in a very positive environment, and when they stay at school, they get the education they deserve. So I want to make sure the Board of Education members, they understand our concern, mm -hmm. such that when we have questions, we can find somebody who are capable mm -hmm. to solve the issue or try to address the issue we have concerns. And uh, I think I have several, quite several times met you before. It's very nice to see you again. Thank you for having me. Uh, so my name is Chao Zhong Zhou, and I I'm currently work, uh, are working for the Chinese school at the Canton School. Uh, so we have a lot of Chinese parents there. So I myself have two kids. Mm -hmm. One is the uh, fifth, will be fifth grade. This is uh, four, and the other is three K. Okay. So that's why I, uh, I, I myself uh, also uh, want to know a lot of what what the candidate is standing. Good. And also, uh, of course, uh, during the all the time I'm working for the Canton School, the Chinese school. So a lot of parents so have. Uh, this and then that kind of concerns mm -hmm. about uh, the candidates. Uh -huh. So they, so we can uh, like the connect all the questions and the answers, and to make them to, uh, to have better uh, decisions in November. Great, That's thank the you. Purpose of all, all, I think for this interview. I really appreciate it, and I really appreciated the forum that you held in the spring, uh, so we could get to know more concerns, we get to know each other. Uh, and so, and it's, it's great to encourage involvement and help people, because these are complicated. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has time mm -hmm. to pay attention to everything, so it helps that you're doing this public service. Yeah, thank community. you very much. Yeah, so, thank you. do you mind give uh, Christine like uh, one or two minutes time to introduce herself? So, mm -hmm. once people click on the video clip, tape mm -hmm. or the voice uh, message, they can uh, understand what her philosophy is, like, uh, some kind of basic introduction okay. yourself, mm -hmm. like one minute or two minutes. Yeah. Sure. What do you think? All right. Um, so my name is Kirsten Coombs, and I am a uh, community activist and a volunteer at my daughter's uh, schools. Uh, she is now in seventh grade at Wild Lake Middle School, and she went to Running Brook. And I've been a volunteer in the schools, and I see what a great job they're doing. And one of the reasons that I wanted to run was because I want to make sure that other families have the same opportunities that she and we do uh, with the Howard County school system. I want to make sure that it's it just it's not just about um, about the test scores, but it's also about making sure that kids are treated fairly and that parents are treated fairly as well because these are our schools, we pay for them, and uh, I think the Board of Education has a responsibility to, to treat us with respect and, um, and I see that disappearing a little bit uh, over the past couple of years and I have concerns with that because what makes our schools successful is about the community and we are not just, um, my, our kids are not just statistics, they're people, and they should be encouraged. And I want to make sure we care about all of our children. Thank you. Right. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, very good introduction. And uh, so, so, I will be here. Okay. So, I will ask some of the questions. I think most of the questions is uh, a lot of uh, have uh, very high impact mm -hmm. and a lot of parents we connected a lot of, we didn't invent the questions we connected the questions uh -huh. that that means that they had a representative what uh, the parents are concerned mm -hmm. okay. yes. so the first question I think is about uh, the GT program okay so the I you know and we know that the power Kong has a very good GT programs, but we also have some concerns is that uh, the size of GT program is uh, forever growing. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same school, so more than 40 percent of the, for example, the students are in the GT math mm -hmm. program, 
There are also some schools that try to place more students in the GP English program. The teachers, so because too many people, too many students are in the GP program, the teachers have to slow down the pace mm -hmm. uh, to accommodate the students who are struggling. First, there will be two categories. One is who is struggling in the GP program. Another is that some very talented and smart uh, students may find the GP program is a uh, they are not being challenged mm -hmm. enough. So what is your thoughts about this? So I have grave concerns about this. When the superintendent came to our school system, one of the things that the board wanted her to do was to increase participation in gifted and talented and advanced placement in high school. And I'm not sure that the statistics should drive why we place a child in gifted and talented and advanced placement classes. Because uh, if a child is not ready to be in that class, then they will drag down a little bit and the, on the other side, those who are ready for accelerated material will be bored. And I am concerned about that. Teachers uh, in, at all levels are being encouraged to push kids into gifted and talented programs because they want to have better statistics to say 70% of our children are in gifted and talented. But how is that really gifted and talented? And how is that hurting the kids who can't keep up? Yes. It's putting too much pressure on those children. So one of the reasons that I wanted my daughter to go to public school was if she was able, I wanted her to have opportunities in gifted and talented because my husband and I did not at our schools when we were younger and we were bored. So if it was appropriate, I wanted her to have opportunities uh, that were appropriate for her level. And I, and I want her to have children that are, are in there because they want to be in there as well. And right now, educators are being told, get those kids into GT. And I don't think that's a good thing for the overall program. So do you think, uh, uh, so a little bit the extent of this mm -hmm. program, of this question. So do you think, uh, I know that currently the, in the school, if you want to join the, uh, enter the GT program, is about 20% of your performance uh, overall in the county, mm -hmm. right? So do you think that kind of uh, specification is, a, is a good or do you want to modify that? Uh, I think that there should be wiggle room um, I think it should be based on some quantitative data, for instance, some test scores, um, and for instance, uh, for some of the elementary gifted and talented programs, the teachers look at how many words a child has, because if they don't have enough words, then they won't be able to understand the gifted and talented program. So those are certain things that are quantitative data that people can make decisions on. Uh, so I think that there are some children that might be on the cusp. You know, they might be almost there. Um, but I, I think we need to be, we need to have objective guidelines for how children get admitted into, uh, into the GT program. I know that at the high school level, there are honors and then the gifted and talented and gifted and talented is also often the same thing as advanced placement classes depending on what the subject is um, so i wonder if there should be another level you know of slightly above grade level but not fully above grade level in the elementary years and the middle school years so that there's more gradation um, but you know, I think the statistics on on children that are above grade level, you know, in the quote unquote gifted and talented, according to educators and scientists, is three percent. Uh, so having forty percent seems a little odd. 
and I do worry that it can take away from classroom time for So for one people. thing uh, people ask this question is about, uh, uh, you know, we have different uh, students at different levels. Right. Like if we put everybody in this uh, gifted program, somehow we put them down the ceiling, make it same square achieved goals, make the um, people more uh, like in the same level. But you, we are not really happy the uh, people are, are unsure. I think one um, one perspective we want help those is those those students mm -hmm. who are uh, uh, advanced level. In the same time, we also want help those students who are need really need help. If you put this student in the middle group, in the advanced group, may not help. And on the right. other side, there are many students who are really need help, mm -hmm. but we are not helping them. Right. That's the Instead, we're I think we're pretending that having these statistics yes. um, is going to make the story real. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, that, but in reality, not all of these kids should be in those classes, and they're going to be unhappy. They're not going to perform academically. They will be discouraged. That's and the yes. major thing. Uh, yes, because a child getting a C in a gifted and talented class is not a great thing. If they could get a B in a regular class and be fully uh, comfortable with the material, right. that should be more important than saying we have 70% of kids in gifted and talented. I met a woman on the campaign trail uh, a couple of months ago who was telling me about her daughter in elementary school. She had, um, she was really struggling in gifted and talented and the school did not want to move her back to grade level. And so she ended up withdrawing her child from the public school to go to a private school where her daughter could, you know, learn at her own pace and she didn't have to deal with the pressure from the administrators of the elementary school pushing, pushing, no, your kid has to be in GT because they care about the statistics. Right. I, think I, don't, I think that does everybody a disservice. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the most important thing, especially for the young kids, is to how they encourage them instead of disencourage them. Yes. If you put that uh, uh, kid in a high pressure, they get disencouraged. Mm -hmm. I think you can somehow destroy a human being instead of just DLC. DLC is really not that big deal. The big deal is you want this uh, kid to be empowered instead of disencouraged. And self-confident. Yes. Yeah, and we destroy that. Mm -hmm. We start destroying that early. I, th I think that's the worst thing an uh, education can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they should feel, they should want to learn. Mm -hmm. And when they struggle and they don't get the, the help that they need, then they, they get discouraged. And so then behavioral issues might start and that, dis that can disrupt class. So there are a lot of problems. I yes. think we need to treat every kid as an individual mm -hmm. and not as a statistic. Mm -hmm. My daughter's a person. And yes, I want to encourage her, but I don't want her to get to the point of losing everything because she might not be good at everything either. Nobody. Right. Some kids are good at math, but they really struggle with words. And by pushing them too heavily, um, you know, on the on the verbal side, on the English and grammar side, might make them discouraged at their math skills. It's okay to focus kids on what they're good at. They don't have to be good at everything. Actually, I have just have some uh, personal experience. One of my niece, uh, she this is a in China. She was put in a, like a gifted program in prison here. She got destroyed, I think, mentality perspective she's got destroyed. I think that's the worst thing an education can do. Yeah. Based on her uh, capability, she is uh, maybe middle or above average. Mm -hmm. But if you put her in a 
there's a highly challenged gifted program. You need to join her. Uh -huh. That's what I've observed in my life. So. Well, and there are kids in our high schools that are taking drugs to stay awake. They're cutting themselves yes. to deal with stress. My only time is because of stress. Right. And, you know, they're taking, you know, Ritalin and other, other drugs to try to push themselves. And it is it's very sad. Okay, so oh, on, maybe on, we can move on. So on, your, on the other side, do you um, think it would be a good idea to uh, make those uh, the kids who are frustrated have an additional uh, program, such as a morning program or something to, to make these uh, kids move forward? So when you say frustrated, do you mean kids that are underperforming? Mm -hmm. okay. In the GT, GT uh, for, for example, the GT program. Do you think it would be a good idea? Or? Well, if they don't belong in the GT program, I'm not sure that they should be, that we should be spending money on, on making sure they can be there. Um, I would rather try to help other kids get to grade level. I mean, if children are already on grade level, then that's, that's the goal of the system, right? Is to get everybody when they graduate as a senior that they have taken four years of, of high school math and maybe one year of college. That they have taken four years of language arts or English and grammar and literature. Um, so I think if children are not ready to be and gifted and talented, then I don't think the school should necessarily be trying to get everybody in there. Because that's what I'm saying with educators yeah, yeah, yeah. Be pushing kids mm -hmm. too much just to drive up the statistics. So so on the other side, so now where we were talking, spend a lot of time talking about the, the, the student who is lagged behind. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, talk a little bit about the, the, the student who is super smart. So do, do you have any uh, uh, ideas about those kind of uh, very super smart students who how to be challenged and not uh, make them think that the GP program is boring for them? So I think that I think this is more applicable to high school because there's only so much advancement you can do. I mean, you can't have a class for one person. But when they get to high school, I think that we need to have a better partnership with Howard Community College so that kids can start, you know, for instance, if they're very talented in math, that they can be able to take advanced math classes and get college credit for them. That's very important to me, because if they are taking college level credits, they, they should get credit for them. Um, and I think we should utilize HCC a little bit more to get uh, those kids those kinds of classes. So, so I'm sorry. So in other words, do you think uh, the idea of like a Montgomery County is a good idea? They have a lot of like uh, uh, the school that are only for the, the super talented. Kids. Oh, so you're talking about like the, the International Baccalaureate exactly. Program mm -hmm. and uh, Montgomery Blair, the yeah, Science yeah, and yeah, Technology yeah. Program. Yeah, n no, I think those are good. If that's what you're talking about, um, mm -hmm. I think that that would be, uh, I would love to explore International Baccalaureate uh, and looking at um, the Science and Tech Program. And they also have an arts program at Montgomery Blair. Mm -hmm. And uh, so- Also like the Virginia, the company, the uh, there is a called the Thomas Jefferson. The oh, school. right. It's a it's a magnet. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Right. So if there is, if we can find space to do that, I would like to begin exploring one or two of those ideas because uh, right now the only thing available to us is HCC. Uh, but I, th I don't know why we don't have an international baccalaureate program in this county. It doesn't, it makes such good sense. Uh, it's been very successful in Montgomery County. I went to school with some people that had gone through it at Richard Montgomery, and it's, it's a great program. And I feel like Howard County should be innovative, and it makes me sad that we're 
that we're not exploring those kinds of things. Thank you. So in the third question, uh, the third question, I think uh, this part, uh, I think it, um, well, people in the third question, people also mentioned about uh, how we should raise the floor. When we help, when we help the um, talent kids to meet their challenge, we also want to help people who are unsure. Mm -hmm. So on that pers uh, pers uh, perspective, so in this question, we, uh, um, we think like uh, there are some things maybe we can help those kids, like uh, such as in the morning program, uh, some kids, if, if they come early, they get their uh, breakfast in the same time there's some kind of teaching activity help them catch up so par so part of me says yes I would like that however it is expensive I know. Um, so I would like to see more programs during the day and I would like to increase math and reading specialists mm -hmm. for during the day and uh, so since my daughter went to a Title I school, and as a me as a volunteer in kindergarten, I saw very large differences in the ability to even recognize letters, right? Okay. So we need to do, um, you know, I think in some cases we need better a, a preschool program where children are um, being read to. It's very difficult, and I know this goes into the socioeconomic question, but um, it's very difficult for some of my daughter's friends when they were little uh, to have the time because their parents, their mom might be working two jobs. And we know that children by the age of three have internalized a lot of words and that drives a lot of their success in elementary school. And so I'd like to see expansion of working with um, the, the under five group to prepare them for kindergarten so that they're starting on more of a level playing field so that their floor is higher. Uh, because uh, when I worked in my daughter's classroom, she was working on her words and she was, she was reading and some of her classmates were still working on the difference between a P and a Q. Mm -hmm. And that makes teaching difficult. There's so many different, different levels. So. Um, where where we can, I think we need to explore expanding the pre-K program uh, for children that are that don't have access to high quality preschool. So you, uh, you when you say expanding the pre-K program, can you elaborate a little bit? Uh, so there What's are your idea? there are some programs. There was a proposal to ex to expand pre-K at Oakland Mills, mm -hmm. which is a you know a high high poverty school. Okay. Um, so that people, that kids could have, could have um, preschool and get started on some of those skills and rather than it just being a daycare, okay. uh, have it actually be educational and explore uh, how that would help. Unfortunately, it's very expensive. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it is it the right thing to do? I think there are some talks uh, you will start like uh, the kindergarten like uh, at age three. Mm -hmm, right. So is that some kind of idea you propose Gopo? So they we do have programs for mm -hmm. for younger students. Okay. Um, and I know one of the things that that has helped that I have some personal experience with is pediatricians mm -hmm. when they see a problem uh, with a child, for instance, speech. A lot of children have speech mm -hmm. development right. problems. Mm -hmm. And Howard County, the public school system, assigns children to the, the elementary school they would go to so they can start receiving speech services mm -hmm. before their kindergarten. Um, but you have to educate your pediatrician community and at, you know what kind of services are available for the um, the zero to five uh, age group because there are programs that are offered that can help kids uh, and might be less expensive than private daycare but we need to publicize that and we need to do better parental outreach 
uh, at, at a lot of schools to make sure people know, because you know, there are a lot of people do, that don't even realize they need to sign up for kindergarten and what the process is. And uh, so I'd like to see more parental outreach to, to get more parents involved mm -hmm. in what's going on at their school, uh, at their local school and what they can expect and how they can learn how to be advocates for their children because often um, lower socioeconomic parents, they don't know what resources are available and they don't know what rights their children have. Uh, so you often see um, much lower participation of, of other races in special education services, for instance, because uh, there might be language barriers, um, there might be, you know, just ignorant, ignorance about what the American school system offers. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we need to do a better job of publicizing some of those things so that we can get parents involved early and often. Yeah, I think uh, this uh, go back to your early point. Many parents, they are doing two, ta uh, two jobs in the same time. Right. Even we want to do that, sometimes it, it, it is impossible. Another thing, like you mentioned, like um, for this pretty uh, or start the pretty early. Uh, I don't know how that gonna how uh, because on one side, of course, taxpayer gonna pay for that. Right. On the other side, uh, I think the purpose to have this uh, for the parents pay for the pre K mm -hmm. or even like a daycare that time right. is like a give people some constraint. So you know your economic uh, capabilities. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you have a few kids you want. I think like uh, we cannot say okay because I love kids I can have ten twenty. I don't care about their future. <laughs> right. Right. I think once we uh, give this kind of free daycare, that means people may just okay. I don't have that constraint. Then do them other. Well, and there, and there are a lot of parents actually that don't want their kids to go to preschool too early mm -hmm. because they want them to, to not be sitting at no a life. desk. Yes. They want them to be playing mm -hmm. because children, I think, I read an article in the New York Times last week about how children are experimenters mm -hmm. and when you try to educate them too early, they lose their creativity. Exactly. And unfortunately, we might lose an iPad when it gets thrown against the wall because a kid is trying to figure out what will happen if I throw it against the wall. <laughs> but children are natural scientists. And that isn't necessarily, you know, reading a book um, or making something perfectly, um, you know, they should be allowed to create. So it's a very complicated issue. I had a couple interesting conversations um, along the campaign trail, um, but I'm trying to figure out what we can do to to help raise that floor. Too. Yeah, I think of, uh, from my personal perspective, I think to raise the floor, maybe like you said, modern program maybe maybe too expensive. I can maybe implement something during school time, like. A during the daily school time, put some extra short for resource for this right. student that may be more realistic. Right. So small group pullouts. I, I okay. noticed when I volunteered, um, you know, working in smaller groups rather than in all sixteen I kids read, yes, might be yes. a little more difficult. But being able to have three or four kids and be able to work with that. Uh, is helpful and um, unfortunately we're taking resources out of the classroom which is another reason that I decided to run because I think instructional assistance uh, throughout the elementary school um, are, they are crucial to helping get getting you know reaching out to more kids and and giving more um, more support to the classroom teachers as okay. their burdens get bigger so Move question four. Uh, so we we uh, have a lot of questions for the parents. That uh, is some parents. So uh, and, and I did kind of talk about that a little okay. bit, but okay. if you want to expand or 
So we just wonder if you are elected, how will you evaluate the situation and what uh, would you do to, uh, to evaluate the situation and help the families in need? I know you, you already did uh, talk to some, but uh, if, if you have the power, what do you have to do? So one thing that I would not have done uh, that was done by this current board was to increase class sizes. That is a major issue, um, especially when you have multiple levels of kids in one classroom. Uh, to increase class size d is, doesn't do anybody good. So I would not have voted to increase class size. I would have voted, I would have tried to look for other places to find money. Uh, and the other thing is instructional assistance uh, and resource specialists for reading and math. Uh, they are able to spend quality time with, with more kids and they're able to supplement a classroom teacher's time. Uh, and you know, we've got a hiring freeze going on now and we've increased class sizes and those two decisions I think are going to hurt our families that need it, need help the most, our kids that need the help. Um, because to me, the most important part of, of our kids' education is the people that they interact with on a daily basis. It's about the educators in the classroom and the, the people in the school building, and that's where we should focus our resources because you, you, if you listen to successful people, they always talk about a teacher or a mentor that saw something in them and helped them achieve their potential. But if, if educators don't have any time, they're not going to be able to diagnose those things and say, oh, you know, I know his mom's really sick and he might need a little extra help and encouragement right now. Um, or, you know, I might need to, to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with him because I know that he, he wasn't able to do his homework last night because, you know, something has happened. Um, you know, like the Ellicott City flood or something, <laughs> yes. you know. Um, so, and it's, so I think we need to make sure we're spending in the building and not at central office. Okay, thank you. And also there is a lot of things uh, about the holidays because we how country has a lot of communities like the Chinese community, the Latino community, of course the, the uh, lot of the uh, Muslim community as right. well. There is a lot of uh, different kind of uh, holidays. Uh, do you support so the school system like conduct a survey on religious and cultural holiday observance? So if you have the power, how would you like to uh, use the results of the survey to benefit the, uh, the Howard County education community? So legally, schools cannot close in Maryland for religion, all right, except for the fact that Easter Monday is a holiday, which is not really a holiday. I'm Catholic, not really a holiday. Um, and so I think we have to look at the operational, but also think about maybe having uh, those days, if we, if we can't legally justify closing, then thinking about running different programs on those days. Um, but I, that hurts me too, because I don't want kids to feel pressure to come to school when they would like to be at home or you know with their family or at their you know uh, at their temple or uh, or mosque. Um, but I I'm looking forward to seeing the results of the survey. Uh, I thought it was very unfortunate that um, this is such a divisive issue um, when I think we have opportunities to find days where things can be, where holidays can be observed uh, that don't, that don't create a divide amongst different members of different communities. I think for these holidays, uh, um, before Howard County maybe, let's say maybe 20, 30 years ago, Howard County is 
very different from today's hard right. company. Mm -hmm. The population composition is dramatically changed. Yes. 20, 30 years ago, we may have one group more and that group less. That's why we have created some holidays for that specific group. And because we are living in a changing world, because we are living in a changing world, I think we have to adjust for the changing trend. Mm -hmm. We don't know what's going to happen 20 years later. 20 years later, I don't think we should use the exactly same policy for today. As 40 years ago, yeah. Yes. yeah. So same thing, like today, we are in a different world. We need to make some adjustments regarding the uh, holidays. Mm -hmm. Before, maybe we only have one specific group need of some uh, day off, that's fine. But today is different. We c I don't think we can just afford to get everybody have their own holiday. Then we don't have to go to school anymore. So right. I think at the time when we in a new world, a changing world, 20 years later from that 20 years before, they always adjust this difference. I think one thing is consider about this, uh, the availability of the, the off days mm -hmm. and what had, has been changed. We have to make the, some adjustment. Right. We cannot just make our close our eyes and uh, without thinking about, okay, today's world is still the same as 20 years ago. No, that's not the fact. We have to see the change, see the fact and make a reaction mm -hmm. based on the, the change. I, I think, I agree, I think we should every year look at the holidays and see how we can, we can manage mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, because we don't want our kids going to school in July right. either, um, or maybe, maybe you do, <laughs> I'm just joking, um, uh, but I think we have to be respectful and I I treasure our diversity. Mm -hmm. That is one of the things that makes Howard County so great. Um, and but, so we have to be respectful of, of different holidays. And the Asian community is 20% growing, mm -hmm. um, and that that should be respected. Um, and you're right, you know, 40 years ago, it was majority white, and we're gonna be majority minority in a couple of years. So I think every year when the when the calendar is looked at, mm -hmm. it should be assessed for you know operational effectiveness, but also respect for mm -hmm. cultural holidays. Exactly, I think like uh, in the past few years, the Chinese community has been pushing really hard, try to get the Chinese New Year, the Lunar New Year, mm -hmm. in the school calendar. Uh, there's some su success. There are also some pushbacks. I totally understand that. Uh, with all these constraints, I think, like I mentioned earlier, we have to make that some adjustment based on the population change. It's different. It's no longer 20 years ago. Right. It's changed. We have to make some adjustment. What really affected me at the meeting, uh, at the Board of Education meeting a, a few months ago, where uh, they were testifying about, or where they were, where they were discussing it, uh, was the current, the former, because now she's graduated, mm -hmm. uh, the student member of the board, Rachel Lynn, mm -hmm. and being, feeling very pressured by, the, by her school day to miss her holidays. And she was, she, she, was, she had a tear definitely in her voice about having to make that choice between school and her family. And that's an unfortunate choice to be forced to make. So, okay, I the, really appreciate your understanding on mm -hmm. our uh, community needs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Take a quick break. Okay. Yeah, quick break. Mm -hmm. um, do we have another space? Oh, sure. Fascinated by. So, we want to come back to question one we didn't ask. Like, COPPA and other community organizations would like to initialize it. Asian American Community Roundtable, and we would like to invite local elected officials and community leaders to meet with Asian Americans in the community on a like, routine basis, for example, monthly or quarterly. Uh, would you like to participate? And uh, any thoughts about increasing open communication between the school system and Asian community parents? I think it's a great idea. I think um, you know communities like 
or round tables like that can become advocates for their community and like i said earlier you know with parents not being able to always go to everything i think it helps to have a central place where if you know five or six people from your community are able to to have a monthly or a quarterly meeting with the board and then you can take that back to your own communities um, that that opens up lines of communication and uh, I think back to the to the calendar issue I think some of the some of the divisiveness that that we've seen I think could have been avoided if there had been more of an outreach by the board to your community and to other communities uh, rather than just uh, proposing and I know there was some representation I know Praveen Panuri was on um, was on a calendar committee um, but I think there should have been more more interaction and more respect for what people were doing if you're gonna invite them to the calendar committee you can't just ignore them for one thing and I think by having uh, an actual official round table with the Asian community I think increases uh, you know responsiveness and accountability uh, for you know hey we met two months ago and we brought this concern to you what's the status of it and by building those relationships I think it also decreases the us versus them kind of thing too so I don't see any harm in yeah, I, I see only benefits to increasing those types of official things where mm -hmm. people can be held to account. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's come back to question seven. So actually this morning I met with several Chinese school teachers and principals about mm -hmm. Chinese uh, classes, language classes in, for example, Tokyo High School. Mm -hmm. They're trying to cancel their AP class. And uh, because they said their budget is short, right? Actually, it's not a budget card, right? Maybe budget is short, but it's not a budget card. So they take this opportunity with the card of the Chinese language classes, right? And I'm trying to get the River Hill High School principal mm -hmm. and some people from central office to we meet with the community yeah. to discuss the issues. So I think a lot of Chinese community actually say want to increase the Chinese language instruction. It's mm -hmm. a world language. And there's a potential to be used worldwide. Mm -hmm. It's like 20 percent of people using that, right? So we want our students have the opportunity to choose something that may be very useful in the future. So I just wonder if you are elected, do you have any thoughts on that? And I, I think mm -hmm. that I feel like I've seen a statistic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, that 66 uh, percent are not Chinese. Chinese. Chinese yeah. So I think. Mm -hmm classes should be offered when there's demand mm -hmm. and if there is a demand for it if there are kids that want to be taking it mm -hmm. then we should try to get that done mm -hmm. uh, I know in in some cases in the math mm -hmm. they've they've set up a distance learning kind mm -hmm. of thing between two high schools mm -hmm. so that a couple kids at a high school that doesn't offer that level of math can be taking it so I think we should look for opportunities like that because we've We've invested a lot of money in our audiovisual and communication technologies in our schools. Mm -hmm. So, if there's not enough demand at the school to mm -hmm. to warrant having a teacher, mm -hmm. uh, then looking into ways to do the distance learning, but mm -hmm. it's still done by a person. Because mm -hmm. I think the question had also mentioned something like online. Yes. yes, because they try to put everything online, even language instruction. I mean, it's kind of from my point of view, it's kind of weird, right? It's not a math or Algebra, right? Like you need a conversation, right? Environment, especially the environment, mm -hmm. right? So it doesn't make sense to me mm -hmm. to be doing language. Christine, uh, you're taking any uh, foreign language uh, class before, like when you were in? Uh, I can speak French, mm -hmm. and I can uh -huh. read Italian, uh -huh. and I can mix up <laughs> French and Italian when yeah. I'm speaking them because okay. they're very similar. So, so based on your experience, uh, what, do you, what do you think? I, if there's demand, if there are kids that want to take Chinese or any other class, 
and they can present there are going to be six or seven kids let's see how we can get it done but in general it's it should be in person i don't understand you know doing it online like because then it, then that also says to me well you might as well just go to the library yeah. and get do it yourself yeah and do it yourself so go buy rosetta stone that seems very dismissive yeah I think that's uh, two perspectives. One is, as you see, the number 66 person. That means a lot of non-Chinese uh, students are interested in this uh, oh, yeah. language. Like you said, that's part of demand. And uh, as taxpayer, we have like 20% of the Asian community in this Howard County. We are the taxpayer. We want uh, our kids to have some kind of culture. Uh, right. culture. <clears throat> we pay the tax. We won't have that. I think that's another thing. That's why somehow we want to push for this. We want this class to be there to meet the need. Uh, like in one of the question, in some in some school area, like uh, for example the River Hill High School, there are uh, the Chinese community is even larger. But in other school community, maybe it's, uh, Spanish is more popular. Mm -hmm. I think we should tailor to the different school need, different school district. For example, in ha ha River Hill, because the Chinese population may be 30%, in that case, maybe we should offer them the Chinese class. In another community, if the Latino Spanish speaker is like 30%, maybe we should think about offer them Spanish class. Mm -hmm. So we cannot just say, okay, because uh, some Sika, that's why we just dump everything. Doesn't matter. The You're not considered about the community, and you're not considered about the student population. We have to make a reasonable cut, not like, not even think about. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of, a lot of these decisions are being made without asking anybody, mm -hmm. yes. regardless if it has to do with the Chinese community or if it has to do with the special needs community. A lot of decisions are being made right now without any without any care or attention. So I really, really, really appreciate and like your, the way you deal with this type of issue. I can help. I can understand that somehow I can feel you have that compassion. You want to involve with the parents mm -hmm. in the community. I really like that kind of attitude. I think if you're somebody working there not working with the community and that's disconnected you're not so that person is not serving the community running that position on that position is someone working in the community with the community if you not have that kind of communication like uh, you make some decision without consult the community community is going to be mad yeah but yeah, if you make the, and, and i believe that things are not black and white they are gray mm -hmm. and not everybody can win mm -hmm. and sometimes but we have to work with each other to make that compromise mm -hmm. instead of it just coming from top down and that goes that's also why i think educators should be more involved in some of these decisions that's because mm -hmm. they know the children mm -hmm and they can make decisions whether or not it's does a child have special needs does a child belong in a gifted and talented class they they know because they have the experience you know it's you know you go to a you go to an orthopedic doctor because they have the experience on your on your feet you don't ask them about your heart so they have the expertise and we have some amazing educators in this county and their voices are being stifled mm -hmm. and that really concerns me i'm not an educator i'm an accountant but i've seen the effectiveness mm -hmm. of, of educators being able to assess the populations of kids that they have mm -hmm. at each school and make decisions you know based on who they're serving right i think that this kind of engagement they're like a the Sorry, BOE really member <laughs> everybody I, I feel hot okay <laughs> not, just <you. laughs> not just me so I think uh, the, this kind of engagement from the BOE to all the teachers, uh, to superintendent, the intendant, and all the uh, community member, parents, this kind of communication really make the service more tailored to the need, not like you said, the top down. And you make some decision not making sense. 
Well, and, and I would point to, to one area where communication was done badly, which was the survey that was done back in May, early yeah. June, the budget cut, the budget cut survey. And um, I refer to that, and I hope this makes sense to you, as do you want us to kill kittens or do you want us to kill puppies? <laughs> All of the choices in it were bad. And that's, it was tailored to be manipulative. Not that the question there, design. The way it was designed was to get a certain result. And a lot of people, as they went through it, started to feel that way and felt, they felt manipulated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you can pretend to be communicative, but there's a difference between cutting it off like that and designing a survey yes. to get results that you yeah. want and an honest conversation. There's a huge difference. Sure. So okay. I'm sorry. I, did, I, I, I really sorry. appreciate all your views and uh, you change yeah. Yeah. Uh, these are opinions. This really help uh, people understand the, the way you're going to work, how you're going to help the community, help the DOE. That's my hope. Let's move to question okay. nine. So what's your plan to increase the transparency for the budget plan? and the general decision-making process? So like I said, I'm an accountant. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that I got involved uh, was, yes, I worked on a, on a political campaign, but I got to know people uh, that were involved in the Operating Budget Review Committee, mm -hmm. and the, the Board of Education stopped it. They said it wasn't working well enough, and we're not gonna do it anymore. So somebody said, well, if, are people interested in still doing it, even if it's not official? So I joined, because I was curious, and started getting into the nuts and bolts of the numbers. And the way that they're presented is very hard to go through. They give everything to you in PDF. Our school system doesn't provide anything in, in Excel, so it makes it very hard to do analysis. You need to type it again. <laughs> yeah. Uh. <laughs> um, and there are other school systems in Maryland, I believe Montgomery County had done it, where they provide the data in CSV or mm -hmm. Excel format mm -hmm. so that you can take it apart and drill down and do analysis between years. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of um, opaqueness in our, in our budget and they make it very difficult to compare things year over year because they'll move people and you kind of okay they moved one position from this department to another department so then you go to that department well we moved two positions from another department in here and we moved one out and so you have to follow it's really difficult to follow and i think that that we do that on purpose to make it hard for the community to ask good questions um, and it's it, people just get frustrated and they go away right that's true so when we when we met um, we we went over a lot of questions that we had about contracts that were awarded without a bidding process for instance I don't know if you've heard about the lawsuit that a mom with spe a, a child with special needs mm -hmm. filed Barb Poupiers mm -hmm. she filed a lawsuit to get the results of a survey that was done of parents and community members for children with special needs. And they, they went, they did not uh, open bid it. They chose a company that has, re has a relationship to the superintendent and awarded a $300,000 contract to this company to do this audit and to analyze our special education services. The results evidently were not good. And one of, one of the board members made a comment to somebody else that the results had not been good. But the school board did not want to release the report. So they released something very high level and Barb sued to try to get the information and the school system fought, and they ended up getting her to pay them $10,000.
So that's how we treat people. We make them go to court to get the results of a $300,000 survey that we paid for as taxpayers. That's not right. Right? So, and then what, what they did, which makes it even worse, like I said it was no bid, right, for a special education survey. The superintendent then went back to the board a few months later and said, can I have $100,000 more for this company to do an assessment of facilities or custodial? Does that have anything to do with special education services? And they gave it to her. They gave her the additional $100,000. Again, no bid. And under, under Howard County procurement law, you're allowed to do a no bid if a company is providing a unique service. Well, this company is not the only company that does this kind of service. Frederick County had a couple of companies that responded to its um, request for proposal. Montgomery County had a couple of different companies that responded. So this one company is not the only game in town, mm -hmm. but we sole sourced it. And that is a, a huge problem uh, that I think is just indicative of how the board is not asking probing questions and not spending our money wisely. So, you know, instead, you know, we're getting rid of instructional assistance mm -hmm. and doing no bid contracts. So yeah, those are obvious and there is some problems there. So if you elect it, what are you, your steps to increase the transparency? I'm going to ask lots of questions. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the current superintendent does is when uh, board members that are asking questions that she doesn't want to answer, she says, we don't have time for that. And I will answer that in the Friday follow-up memo. Okay. So she, she answers it outside of the public board meeting. And one of the ways that she's able to do that, that I would like to change, is that right now the superintendent sits next to the chair of the board. So she's effectively able to run the meeting. So in December when I'm elected, I will vote to not have her sit next to the chair. Okay. Um, that is, I see her doing it. I go to board meetings, because like I said, I'm pretending this is my, I'm acting like this is my job. Not pretending, I'm acting like this is gonna be my job. So I see the, inter, the, the, the interplay between the superintendent, the current chair, uh, and I think it's, it's terrible because Bess wants to know how our money is being spent. Mm -hmm. And the public should be able to get to see that question answered mm -hmm. um, and not have to wait for it. So that's something that I would try to change. I am only one vote, but that would be a goal of mine so that we can have time to ask maybe the uncomfortable questions. Every board member you know, has the right to, to ask questions, and right now it's being stifled, mm -hmm. just like the educators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's move to question 10. How many schools and teachers have you visited in the past 12 months, uh, or how many parents and parent groups have you met in the past 12 months during your campaign? And uh, in your assessment, what are their main concerns? So, I've probably been to 30 to 40 schools mm -hmm. uh, in the past year. Uh, I've, whether it's been doing simulated congressional hearings or volunteering or um, or going to PTA meetings, that kind of thing, a mix of a mix of things, mm -hmm. uh, and probably a dozen different community groups and you know and parents and um, and the main concerns I hear are. Um, class size, overcrowding, and worrying about teachers leaving. Mm -hmm. we, um, we had, we had a, yeah, losing staff. We had an early buyout program mm -hmm. 
so teachers that had either 25 or 30 years, I can't remember, um, if they had that amount of time, they could get early retirement. Mm -hmm. And we lost 10,000 hours of experience. 10,000 years, I'm sorry, 10,000 years. Yes, 10,000 years of experience. And that's not just classroom teaching that we lost. We lost leaders for new teachers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. mentors for incoming teachers. Mm -hmm. um, we lost all of that experience to save money. Mm -hmm. And great, definitely, you're always going to have a couple of bad teachers. Not every one of those teachers was perfect. Mm -hmm. But we lost some great teachers mm -hmm. uh, that decided they were tired mm -hmm. of dealing with the shenanigans mm -hmm. um, and tired of you know trying to voice their opinion and being told be quiet mm -hmm. we don't want to hear it mm -hmm. and uh, they they made the choice for themselves that all right fine I can walk away and I can get this early retirement and to me that's sad so I have concerns that we're not retaining our educators mm -hmm. and attracting mm -hmm. I'm very concerned about attracting Mm -hmm. new educators um, are we going to get the best and brightest if we're known as a system that tells our teachers to be quiet mm -hmm. um, and you know are we an attractive system so what used to happen 15 20 years ago everybody has always known that Montgomery County pays a higher teacher salary mm -hmm. their lifetime earnings is much higher in Montgomery County mm -hmm. But people would come to Howard County, teachers would teach in Howard County because they liked the atmosphere, the cooperation, and they liked the working environment. So they were willing to make less mm -hmm. than Montgomery County. And if it's not a good environment anymore, then how are we going to attract the best and brightest educators that have the energy and the desire um, to, to be with our kids. So uh, you are uh, elected. Um, how can you make sure we uh, like uh, keep this uh, really experienced good teacher in the same times? Uh, if their teacher are not that good, uh, how we can uh, remove those less qualified or somehow help them to improve their skills? So that's a question I hear a lot on the campaign mm -hmm. trail. Teachers get to keep their jobs regardless, and you know other professions. That's not true. So one of the things that the teachers union here mm -hmm. had developed, with the help of the board, this is a few years ago, a a peer assessment program, uh -huh. where if teachers are are struggling. And sometimes, even if they're new teachers, it might be an orient orientation mentor kind of program. But to do a peer review program where you give teachers um, a coach that is someone that has been in the classroom, but they're taking time outside of the classroom. Montgomery County has a program like this uh, where they'll get they'll be they'll be assigned a caseload of four or five teachers and they'll they'll try to assist those teachers on classroom management lesson planning uh, and and help them to get better at those at those things and then like in the case of Montgomery County if a teacher doesn't really seem to be getting it after a couple of years then they are terminated and so that's something that our union has tried to implement, they spent a lot of time designing a program to do this um, because they know not every teacher is good either, right? We've all had experiences with one teacher that you're like, why are they in the classroom? And the board shut it down. They had been open to it, but then they stopped. And I think it's a decent program. It's working very well in Montgomery County. Um, and. I think it's I think it's a fair thing to do. So that's something you promote one if you are. Yeah, like, there's already a template. They already did most of the work. We are re wasting all the effort. Right. right? Yes. Right. Because mm -hmm. you say to teachers, okay, here's something that we know is sometimes a problem. Help us fix it. Mm -hmm. And so they did. I'm friends with one of the guys who helped who helped write it. 
and then to slam the door and say, never mind. So I think like one way to help the teacher, I think many times, like you mentioned, some teachers are sniffed because people don't want them to talk about the truth. Uh, I think one way as a board member, if you are elected, maybe we can somehow open the channel mm -hmm. to allow the teachers to voice their opinions to uh, the BOEs. To you, so that way, as BOE, are, you are not so disconnected to the teachers. Here, the same time. Here's something that ha a lot of teachers have reached out to me because okay. I've, um, you know, so I've, be, I've been building those relationships and they know that I'm on. I'm not on their side. I I want to hear from them. Okay, mm -hmm. I got a Facebook message from a woman who was using her husband's Facebook account because she was scared to use her own. <laughs> so, where are we living? We don't want. <laughs> Nobody want that. Right. See, it just seems so. People are so scared. Okay, let's move okay. to some uh, easier topics. Do you, do you yeah. Easier. Let's <laughs> <laughs> uh, last one. Okay. This one. okay. Uh, food. <laughs> food. Food, glorious uh, food. Do you want to have some cold drinks? I can get you. I don't want to feel too hot. You... No, let's finish this one. Then okay. we'll stop for this session. And then okay, we'll okay. have okay. All right. some. Yeah. Yeah. Free, free yeah. to ask and questions. There are some like, many Asian students, Latino students in the school system. And some schools have very high portion of Asian students, or some of them have high portion of Latino students. You know, the food is a little different from the yep. traditional white population food, mm -hmm. or they have some unique uniqueness in their food, right? And the food is kind of associated with the culture. Yeah. Do you know whether school meals have these kind of options, or they have universal meals? Uh, I have heard. I have heard it, I, at least one board member. Mm -hmm ask the food services director mm -hmm. about that. I think it would be a great idea because I know my daughter is not thrilled with the options mm -hmm. uh, at her school. Pizza, pizza, pizza. Pizza, pizza, right, right. <laughs> Popcorn, chicken. <laughs> like, I don't know that that's my white food either. <laughs> I'm white. You I don't, are first. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I think we should diversify the throughout the system uh, and have a couple more offerings that are more interesting for mm -hmm. one thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of us in this county, you know, are, um, you know, somewhat, you know, food's important to us, yeah. right? And we have <laughs> such a diverse, you know, mm -hmm. restaurants, you know, Indian, Asian, Korean, I mean, drive on Route 40. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, so I really think that we should have some more interesting stuff because kids, and I think it would be a good time to start it in elementary school because kids are more interested in trying some new stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and my daughter hasn't eaten lunch at school in, since like second grade because it's it's uninteresting. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can see that. I went into my daughter to summer school. I looked at food. My gosh, how can I eat that food? <laughs> <laughs> so I think for this issue, there. Are uh, I can see there are two options. One is like, uh, uh, like Chow mentioned, because different uh, communities have different uh, racial uh, proportion. For example, in Clarkville, there may be more Asian. Maybe we should provide more Asian food for that school. And let's say in another school, maybe we have more Latinos. Maybe in that school, we provide more uh, Latino food. Because, like, uh, for example, my kids at home, they're going to eat Chinese food for sure. So wouldn't they want to eat Latino food at school? Mm, I mean, <laughs> they, they would open to, for that, but yeah. I think like, uh, I'm, for, I'm sure for you, you also want to get something more close to your own culture, mm -hmm. instead of like too far away. Mm -hmm. Maybe when they grow up, they can open to uh, more things. I think the purpose, first we want the food to be healthy and they feel comfortable. Right. And in this uh, highly uh, Asian community, maybe we should consider that option. But in another com uh, community, if it's like a ninety-nine percent are cousin white, and you provide them Chinese food, they may feel weird. Uh, why am I eating that? So in the same thing. But I think it would be a good yeah. way to I think, expose yes. children right. to think, some of the diversity uh -huh. on a periodic basis. Yes, um, I agree with that. Periodic basis, not like not a every daily day. basis. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
in uh, some schools, if you uh, have a high proportion of one specific cultural group, maybe we should consider provided daily. I think, I think what they're looking at is trying to diversify mm -hmm. some of it. Um, but we also have to think about costs. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, going back to my accounting, I think we have to be, we have to make mm -hmm. sure that we're, we're also getting the best bang for the buck and that we're, uh, we need to make sure that meals are still um, affordable. Yes, affordable um, and healthy. Affordable, yeah. I mean, we and we have laws about the, you know, how how much salt can be in something, or you know, there can't be, you know, the percentage can't be, you know, ninety percent high fat or some, you know, those kinds of guidelines. So among these school you visit, have you ever tried any of their lunch meals? No. No. Okay, let's take a break. Now. Okay, you are for the third session. No, oh. you, you guys okay, can. Okay, I think the third session we probably ask some free questions. Okay. And, uh, some questions we may think important. And uh, do you have any questions? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I can do it. Uh, so there's some question because uh, you know. All the uh, counties, uh, different counties have different uh, ways to deal with uh, the school voucher and charter school. Uh, oh, what, mm -hmm. What's your opinion on those part? So I actually went to private school, mm -hmm. but I am not in favor of using public money for charter schools. Mm -hmm. um, I, as an accountant, I am very nervous about how they use money. Mm -hmm. They are often for-profit mm -hmm. companies that own different ones around the, you know, around the country, and they're in it to make money off our children, and they siphon off tax dollars to do that. Okay. And I know there's been a case in Ohio where there's an online school, uh -huh. and the state has gone back and said, uh, I don't think, we don't think that you should have been paid for all those students, mm -hmm. because it doesn't appear that they're actually getting educated. And so I, after looking at some of these, I'm not sure about them. The other thing is, uh, with from what I've seen with charter schools, mm -hmm. a lot of them are not performing any better mm -hmm. than uh, traditional county schools. Okay. Um, so I, I don't think that we have any need in Howard County mm -hmm. for charter schools. And I also don't like that the teachers don't have to have the same, they don't, there aren't the same requirements mm -hmm. for their teaching background mm -hmm. as there are in the county. Okay. So I don't think that anybody who graduates should just be able to go teach. I think that there should be some requirements and standards. And so the, a, a lot of those things make me nervous about sending my tax dollars when I'm not really sure about <clears throat> the quality of the okay. teachers, and I'm not sure about how the money is being used by these these for-profit corporations above. Mm -hmm. So uh, are you familiar with the Howard County uh, policy regarding these uh, vouchers and charter schools? Um, in regard, we have a charter office, uh -huh. but nobody has come up with a plan. Mm -hmm. So we do technically have an office of like one mm -hmm. person, mm -hmm. um, but nobody has come forward with a proposal um, that has met, I guess, the board standards. Okay. So, and I know that, I know at least a couple of members of the current board are very against them uh -huh. as well. Uh -huh. um, but I think it's sort of a problem in search, or I think it's a solution in search of a problem mm -hmm. as well. Um, and I'm just not, I just haven't seen the evidence that they're doing any better than traditional public schools. Okay. And I, and I feel like there are more, as, as much as I dislike the amount of transparency we have right now, I, we still have some. Okay. The only way don't. With, with, with hmm? charters we okay. don't. Do we Voucher, have? I'm not sure that we have any... 
I can't remember anybody talking about vouchers in the Do county. we have any uh, like a uh, charter school in uh, Howard County? No? Mm -hmm. yeah. Nope. So okay. uh, I heard uh, there is some parents uh, uh, saying about the lunch time problem. So some said because uh, I believe it is because the cafeteria the room is limited. So uh, some kids like the the lunch time is almost 1:30 p.m. or 2 o'clock. So that may not be good for the kids. Or on the other side, yeah. Uh, the, so like my daughter, I think she had lunch at 10:45. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, so I actually talked about it with superintendent. I said, can we have kids have their lunch in the classroom? That will solve that problem very much. Okay. Mice. Mice. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Mice. Uh, so it's more of a... They try to mm -hmm. not do that because it's a custodial mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. but yeah. like a, for example, the uh, Glenelg summer school, they are doing that in the classroom. Oh, really? Why did they have, have math problems? At Glenelg High School? Yeah. Well, uh, the summer school, at least they eat their lunch at their classroom. Right? In, so, the, in the public school? No. The, the summer camp. They use summer camp. Camp. Oh, right? oh, oh, Glenelg Country Day School? Uh -huh. Ah. It's a private school, but it's a can, private, yeah. they can do that. Why would you do that? Right? I think that's that's been the reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, our schools are larger than, mm -hmm. than that school is going to be. Um, so that's something I think maybe it can yeah, be. More than, more than 1,000 students. That probably just but, across, but there are levels, though, aren't there? Yeah, different it's, levels. It's K through 12? Yeah. So you think that currently it would be difficult to improve those kind of lunch time problems? Yeah, I mean we've got capacity problems. That's that's another thing. Um, and then you've got electronics in the in the rooms now. Uh, so you don't want food around those kinds of things. Um, it definitely is a problem. I know kids are either starving or they're not hungry when they have <laughs> when they That's have their lunch. Yeah. Early. Oh, when she gets home, she eats the refrigerator every day. <laughs> and I didn't know that about girls because mm -hmm. usually they say boys. When mm -hmm. boys start to become teenagers, the boys eat everything. Mm -hmm. Girls do it too. Mm -hmm. She comes home and is eating. I mean, she's almost eating the refrigerator itself. Mm -hmm. She's starving. Yeah, yeah. Because she's so hungry. Eleven o'clock. I feel like they still need a snack. Yeah. You know, like there should be like a ten-minute break someplace for mm -hmm. snack. But I think, I think the main concern is is the capacity of the cafeteria. Yeah. You know, and I think have you on the if we have you on the bar, maybe. Uh, really bring something new, like uh, because your personal experience, like uh, your new will, sometimes your experience is uh, something you can really bring something new. If someone, okay, I know this, uh, I don't care anymore. Or, uh, <laughs> it doesn't affect me. Right. I don't have kids anymore in the system. Right, yeah. right and I, yeah, obviously I will. So I remember when I was uh, in China, uh, in, like uh, when we were in school, Especially before college, like uh, I think in the, for example in the morning, morning time is the half day. I would say like uh, the school year is let's say start from seven to uh, eleven thirty. Mm -hmm. Around the middle the time we have snack time, like uh, uh, people uh, kids can eat something either get from school or bring to the school. So more like snack and then they have their uh, lunch around 11 30 or 12 right that's more reason more I think it's like um, if you feel hungry you eat in the middle if you're not you don't have mm -hmm. and then you space up the time more reasonable yeah um, I think the other thing about having lunch um, getting out of the classroom is they do want kids to feel like they have some free time and it's a little harder to have that, mm -hmm. you know, in the classroom. But because I, I know at Running Brook they tried to really avoid doing that. Um, um, but I don't know. I think I just think of mice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, it is a big problem. Okay. I have one question. 
uh, how do you feel the discussion now like in equality and the injustice? Sometimes people like, equal the answer the injustice, equal to inju inequality. How do you feel? Do you mean as far as um, discipline? No, it's just maybe the discussion. For example, I read a New York Times article said that because some people are poor, mm -hmm. that is equivalent to injustice. And uh, I think that's uh, inequality, not injustice. But now the discussion shift say, okay, inequality means injustice. So I just wonder, you have any feeling on that? Uh, my, I'm going to approach it from a different standpoint. What mm -hmm. I'm trying to teach my daughter and what I'm trying to become better at is empathy mm -hmm. and approaching people where they are mm -hmm. and not where you think they should be. Mm -hmm. um, because that's based on your sense, mm -hmm. uh, and you have to to listen to other people and mm -hmm. try to walk in their shoes, mm -hmm. and that's that's what I'm really trying to do as an adult, mm -hmm. and try to learn about other cultures mm -hmm. and why what different experiences have formed. Mm -hmm. Like um, at the forum this spring. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, so I've lived here my entire life. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm a woman, and I was very excited to get the vote. You know, to, when I turned 18, I was very excited. And I have voted almost every time since I turned 18. Mm -hmm. I missed one presidential election. And it's really important to me. And I was glad, I'm glad that you all are reaching out to, to candidates and doing these kinds of things because it's helping me get to know you more, right? Mm -hmm. And the president, I think Jean, mm -hmm. uh, she made a comment after the forum mm -hmm. that and she said, Chinese do not vote. It's not part of our culture. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's not given the, you know, the constructs of your, of, you know, your homeland. Mm -hmm. um, and I apologize. Are you all Chinese? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> meaning, I, no one. First dinner. <laughs> right, but no, nobody's Taiwanese. Um. Okay, um, and that she said, you know, we don't vote typically. It's not something that culturally we're used to doing. And so by having this kind of dialogue and presenting this, encouraging people to go out and vote and, and learn about it. And that was, that was interesting for me because I hadn't thought about it. Uh, I think uh, the story you mentioned is like, uh, I would say it is the, we are living in a changing world. Uh, I would say uh, that may be more true among people like a uh, above, but for generation like us, you can see we are very engaged. Right. And uh, if you talk about the voting rate, you're going to see a dramatic increase. Uh, yeah in the past few years. Yeah. The Chinese community is uh, really motivated to get involved uh, on all level of uh, elections from like this kind of local mm -hmm. to national mm -hmm. elections. And uh, usually I think first it's because there's some Chinese cultural background. There are also things like uh, most of these uh, new immigrants mm -hmm. where, um, my name is, uh, at least have a master degree, many have a PhD, uh, yep. postgraduate degree. They know the issue, they, uh, they really care about the community. They, they want, like, a, you know, Chow, he, really, he has two young kids and he still spends a lot of time yep. in the community, not just uh, for the Chinese community. He care about the, the country. Yes. And like uh, yesterday, he uh, went to uh, the Alaska city to help. I think there's some kind of uh, some some uh, uh, some kind of activity to help uh, people who were affected by mm -hmm. the flood. So I think, as you can see, this this generation uh, Chinese is very engaged. They yeah. want we want to get involved. We want to cast our vote and cast our vote in a more like a uh, I would say have a deep understanding. How like uh, cast our vo vote in uh, more this uh, based on some kind of uh, evidence, not okay, just uh -huh. based on something. Okay, 
if other people say I will do it. It's not like that. So I think uh, this type of things is really changing. It's cool. So I, I kind of answered your question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. And I hope I did not offend. No. By no, no, no. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, I think. Yeah. I think it's, it's good to know. I mean, people don't have the background. It's good for them to know that background. And then eventually they understand the others better. I think that's why this kind of communication is very important. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, for you come to us, you mm -hmm. understand us better. We understand you better. In the same thing, it's like uh, you go out to the Korean community, go mm -hmm. to the Indian community, Latino community. When you talk to them, they understand you better, and you understand them mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. Like uh, even just for neighbors, if we communicate, we understand each other a lot more better. Mm -hmm. So, so I think yeah. we are good today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay, well, no question. Maybe. Do you want to close mm. this statement? <laughs> <laughs> well, I really appreciate this. This has been really good um, because it helps me. Obviously, the way your questions were designed, I thought that was good. It was. Um, it, I know that it was coming from from parents and from community members, and it wasn't um, just some standard kind of thing. So, it, and it, it expressed your concerns, and I, I think we have similar ones. Uh, and I'm not going to agree with you all the time, and you know we're all different people. But I hope that what you can see is that I'm a listener, and I like to learn, and I want to make decisions based on that. And I want to I I like evidence, and not just financial evidence, but you know people's opinions, people's experiences, uh, to make a, a well-rounded decision. So I hope that you know that when I'm confronted with an